Thanks for joining us tonight here at Liberty Baptist Church. It's Wednesday in the Word, and tonight we have a message from the Word of God concerning Saul and David. What makes a great leader? I hope it'll be an encouragement to you tonight as you join us for Wednesday in the Word. Hey, good evening and welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study. Tonight, I want to explore with you a topic from the life of David. Each morning here at Liberty Baptist Academy, I have the privilege of teaching about 18 to 20 students. And our study over the last few uh, weeks has been specifically about the life of David. There's several things that strike me about the life of David as I start to explore his life and see a little bit more intimate details, because we know many things about David's life. He was the great champion who took a sling and a stone and cut off the head of Goliath. And he was the great champion who brought the Ark of the Covenant back in. He was the one who made the preparations for there to be a temple in Israel. But when you examine his life, Though he had many admirable qualities, there were several things that you would observe and say, that's that's pretty bad. Prior to David ever coming on the scene, God had established Saul as the king of Israel. Saul, the Bible tells us, was a prime specimen for leadership. If there was a book that was written about how to be dressed for success, Saul would have been that person. His demeanor, his stature. The Bible tells us he was head and shoulders above every one of his contemporaries. Every peer looked up to him. He was a physical specimen of what was greatly desired for the children of Israel. They wanted to see somebody who was at least as good as, and now they had somebody who was better than all the other countries as their leader. But Saul, in his arrogance or in his sin or perhaps even his apathy would lose the privilege of being king. The Bible describes several instances 
where God confronts Saul through the prophet Samuel. The very first instance is a place where God has given a command to uh, uh, go and fight against an enemy. And in that command, as was their tradition, as was their place, they uh, would offer a sacrifice. The Bible tells us this in 1 Samuel chapter 13. If you have it, I encourage you to go there. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, in verse number 8, the one who was to lead the sacrifice, asking for the blessing, similar to the way we might pray for food before, words, uh, before eating a meal, here, Saul is waiting with great anxiety for this potential battle. People are starting to rumor and leave and not hang out there. And so Saul presumes to take upon himself something that he was never ordained to do. In verse number 8 of 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 8, the Bible says this, He tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed, but Samuel came not to Gilgal. The people were scattered from him. And Saul said, Bring me up thither a burnt offering and a peace offering. And he offered the burnt offering. Saul, in his anxiety, in his tension, in his desire for a quick resolution to this impending crisis, he takes upon himself a office that he was never ordained to do so. And so the Bible tells us that in doing so, he reaps to himself great consequences. Samuel would eventually confront him. And in the very next chapter, verse, or very next uh, page, verse 14 says this, Thy kingdom shall not continue. Samuel confronts Saul. He says, Your kingdom is not going to continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. Hmm. We see Saul's failures here. The first one is that he offers a sacrifice that he's not supposed to. If you go over another chapter to 1 Samuel chapter 17, the Bible tells us about another conflict where Saul is commanded to go and fight against an Amalekite um, uh, army. These Amalekites had gravely destroyed and hurt and caused a problem for the children of Israel. And the time of their arrogance, their rebellion against God, had exceeded its end. And so God says, okay, it's time for us to deal with this situation. He sends Saul in. He says, I want you to obliterate them all. 100%, I want you to take care of every single man. <coughs> Excuse me, every single woman. Every single person needs to be taken, not even an ox or a lamb needs to be spared. The Bible tells us that Saul goes and fights against them and has an incredible victory. But he saves a trophy of the Amalekite king named Agag. He saves some of the best of the sheep and some of the best of the oxen. And he leaves these as a spoil for the men. Again, Samuel confronts him. And when he confronts uh, Saul, he says, to them, he says to him this in verse number 22. For Samuel 15, 22, he says, Samuel said, Hath God as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? He says, To obey is better than sacrifice, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. He hath also rejected thee from being king. When he goes down to verse number 28, a very sad epitaph is left on the end of this chapter. The Bible says, And Saul said to him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom from Israel this day, and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thee. I want you to see Saul had failure, and in that failure he disobeyed the word of God. In arrogance he took his own uh, counsel, rather than taking the position that God had given him, and he made excuses for the things that God had placed in his life. We see not only Saul's problem, but when we start to see Saul's problem, we see Samuel's prophecy. Samuel's prophecy confronts the king, and that prophecy says God is looking for somebody who's after his own heart. He's looking for somebody who desires to please him. Saul, throughout his life, made a decision that he would choose the stuff over the kingdom. At his inauguration, we find him hiding in a, a bushel of stuff. 
the Bible says. Here, we see him seeking the stuff rather than seeking obedience. Even at the end of his life, he seeks to have fulfillment and a, a final meal, hanging out with a witch in his life. He seeks the stuff. And so Samuel gives a prophecy. I'm looking for somebody who's more concerned. The, the Lord wants somebody who's more concerned with him than all of this stuff. And Samuel's prophecy starts to come to fruition. Saul's problem was diagnosed, but Samuel's prophecy is God wants somebody who is after his own heart. Hmm. Somebody who's after his own heart. Then he says, somebody who is better than you. He says in 1 Samuel chapter 15, in verse number 28, he has given and hath given it the kingdom to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. Huh. Samuel's prophecy demonstrates a strength of purpose. If you understand the life of David, there was a whole lot of issues. When you look at Saul's problems, you see he liked money. He worshipped God on a way he wasn't supposed to. He, he didn't execute enough people. He wasn't as violent as God told him to be. And I got to be honest with you, as I look at all the failings of, of Saul, you could say, man, I can relate to those failings of Saul. But there's a strength in the purpose of David that is demonstrated over and over again. What made David a strong leader? The thing that made David a strong leader are outlined in a number of different ways. We see he was loyal to God. We see he's honest. We see he has common sense. We see that he takes immediate action and he demonstrates wisdom. We see that he is ambitious. I'm not just going to take 100. I'm going to go and fight against 200. We see that the ambition of David is strong. We see not only this, that he has a forgiving spirit. We see that he has a concern for his parents. And the Bible teaches us this in uh, 2 Samuel chapter, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 22. Uh, he has a concern for his parents. He has a willingness to admit when he is wrong. He desires the will of God in 1 Samuel chapter 23. He's a great military man. The Bible tells us that God taught his hands to make war. In fact, when he's going to build the temple, God says, you know what? It's not time to build the temple. It's time for you to continue to make war because you're a bloody man. I want a person of peace, Solomon, to build the temple. So the strength of purpose was not found in any one of his qualities because every single one of those qualities you could look at as a negative. David wasn't always honest. David was not always courageous. There is a time whenever David meets a giant, but there's also a time when David acts like a lunatic so that he doesn't have to be confronted by a Philistine king. David, for all of his great admirable qualities of characteristics, all of those admirable qualities and characteristics could all have a line through them. He was virtuous, unless you ask Uriah. He was a great man, unless you were to ask Ahithophel. He was honest. He was authentic, unless you were to ask Michael, his wife. You see, there were so many qualities that demonstrated a poor lack of character. So what was the difference between David and Saul? The difference was both of them made mistakes, but one of them had the purpose, the strength of purpose, to make it right. There was an authenticity inside of David's life that even when he failed, he desired to be right with God. Even when he blew it, he acknowledged it. How do we develop that authenticity? Can I share with you a couple of things and our time will be finished? The thing that brought strength of purpose to David's life was, number one, a sensitivity to the things of God. It's easy to become calloused, isn't it? It's easy to allow yourself just to become hard to certain things. We are bombarded with so many different visuals and effects, and 
we're not sure what is authentic and what is real and can I trust this? Is this fake news? Is this real news? I've got to search out the sites and, and it's easy to become cynical in our day and age. And I don't know that skepticism is always wrong, but I do know this, that whenever the word of God speaks, we need to be open, we need to be tender to it. David was tender to the things of God. When priests would come in and confront him about a sin, he was tender to the things of God. Whenever he was confronted about an issue or a problem, he was tender to the things of God. Even in times where he was being praised, there's a story that the Bible tells us in 2 Samuel where men go out and they, they sneak into Bethlehem so that they could just get him a canteen full of water and they bring him the canteen full of water. And he is so moved by that that rather than taking a sip of the cool water from his hometown, he pours it out as an offering to God to show respect to people. There was a sensitivity to the things of God. We all mess up. Nobody's perfect. But there has to be, if there's going to be strength and purpose for our lives, there needs to be a sensitivity to the things of God. If you're watching this right now, it's a demonstration that you are sensitive to the things of God. On a time when nobody's going to check, nobody's going to call, nobody's going to check your URL to make sure that you logged on, I praise God for your sensitivity to the things of God. You're open to what God has for you. You want to learn what God has for you. So if we're sensitive to the things of God, the thing that made David great was not that he could fling a stone, but that he was sensitive to the things of God. Number two, he was willing to admit his wrongs. David, when you read through uh, the book of Psalms, you come to Psalm chapter 51, the Bible says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation and renew a right spirit within me. David, in his candor about his sin, just seeks to get right with God. A willingness to admit, I have done. He uses phrases like, against thee and thee only have I sinned. Wow. If we can take that approach in our life where I, I want to know, I'm sensitive to what God is teaching me. Number two, I'm willing to be right with God. Number three, a willingness to make things right with others. David struggled with this. He struggled with his son Absalom. He struggled with his uh, cousin, Joab. He struggled with Michael. I think he probably struggled with each one of his wives and concubines. I think the relationship issues that we see with his children demonstrate uh, I don't know exactly what to do, but I want to make things right. But there's something in his life, especially in reference to Solomon, when you start to see the end of 2 Samuel conclude and the beginning of 1 Kings start to talk about David and Solomon's interaction, there's a definite investment where David says, I'm going to make sure even though this whole situation, even with your mom and you being born, comes out of a, a very difficult place, I want to be right with you, David. I think we see that at the end of his life whenever he's talking with Bathsheba. I'm going to make things right with you. We see that even with Michael at, the end, of, there's, at the, the end of his life, that tension between the two royal families. He makes things right. God desires for you not only to make things right with him, but he desires for you to make things right with others. Are you right with people? Is there somebody right now that you can't look at or think of their name without a poor feeling coming to bright. God desires for us to have right relationships with other people. David, he was sensitive to things of God. He made things right with God. He made things right with others. And he set a purpose with his life. He was never idle. I think one of the things that's been challenging over our time in the last year or so is the easiness with which we're commended to be idle. Stay home, stay safe. And though I think there might be some validity to that, God desires for us to be active. David never sat, even as an old man. The Bible tells us he wants to go out and slay giants. God has some victories in your life and my life. 
And there needs to be an eagerness, a, a heart that says, oh, God, what do you have next for me? Oh, God, where are we going next? What are we going to do next? Never an idleness. The time whenever David was idle was the time whenever he got in the biggest trouble. Whenever you read the story of him and Bathsheba, the Bible says it came a time when kings should go forth to battle. Where's David? The Bible says he's laying in his bed at noonday. God doesn't desire for any of us to be great binge watchers or uh, noble nap takers. God desires for us to be active with our lives. God desires for you to be accomplishing, producing, working. And David was always ambitious with his purpose. And then number five, he always gave glory to God. The Bible talks, just read the book of Psalms. And he goes through, and all of the praise and all of the adoration lavished upon God, because at the end of the day, a great leader, he has to be authentic. And that authenticity will always lead us to realize what God has done is great. And I give him the praise for everything that he has done. Saul had problems, and, and Samuel had to give a prophecy about that. But the salvation of purpose was brought through a person who said, okay, I'm going to be authentic. And in my authenticity, that means that I am sensitive to God. Not only am I sensitive to God, but I, I am right with him. I'm right with others. And in that rightness, I'm going to be ambitious. I'm going to be looking for opportunities. But then also, I'm going to make sure that God gets all the praise for my life. How about you? Can you praise God for what's been happening in your life? Can others see a reflection of your authentic desire to serve the Savior? That's what truly separated Saul from David. Saul wallowed in his self-pity. Saul left a legacy of disappointment. David, though flawed in many areas, left a legacy of victory. And we can too. I hope that's an encouragement to you tonight. Father, thank you for your word. Help us to remember it and apply it to our lives. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us tonight here on our Wednesday in the Word. I hope that you'll be with us Sunday morning. We have services at 8, 9.45, and 11.30. Each week, people are being baptized. They're growing in their walk with Him. I also encourage you to come to a connection class, 5 p.m. every Sunday night. We have Awana and connection classes. It is a great experience. And we hope that you'll be here experiencing liberty with us right on campus. I want to remind you that this ministry operates because of your faithful giving. People like you make Liberty Baptist Church possible. And I thank God for your faithful giving to this ministry. If we can be a help to you in any way, please call the church at 702-647-4522 or drop a line at experienceliberty.com. There's an email link there. We'd love to connect with you. Thanks again for watching with us tonight, and God bless.